cordially invite the next session chairpersons, uh, Dr. Terrell Fernando, consultant family physician, and Dr. K.H.D. Milroy, consultant family physician, to take their seats at the stage. And the next session, we'll, we'll, we will have three resource personals. First one, steering through STIs for effective management by Dr. Arunidi Silva, consultant family vision, and then taking a load of load off navigating low volume swelling by Dr. Lalanta Senaratna, consultant family vision, and also the past president of the college, and also mind matters addressing anxiety and depression in primary care by Dr. Hiranthini Di Silva, consultant family vision. Chairpersons, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the first lecture is uh, steering through STI for effective, man uh, effective management, uh, which will be done by Dr. Aruni Di Silva. Uh, Dr. Aruni uh, Hasante Di Silva is a specialist family physician uh, affiliated to Department of Family Medicine at Faculty of Medicine, University of Sri Javadhanapura. She received her postgraduate training at the primary care research unit at Keele University, UK and obtained MRCGP in year 2014. Dr. Aruni is a certified examiner in MRCGP examination and provides her expertise as a senior lecturer as well as mentor in postgraduate training in family medicine. Uh, over to you, Aruni. A very good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. So within the next 20 to 25 minutes, let me take you through uh, uh, the essence, what is essential for a family doctor when it comes to managing STIs. Right. So uh, broadly speaking, I will give you an overview about management of STIs, followed by focusing on uh, three STIs uh, based on the available time I would see how I can uh, go through the essential uh, bits in relation to these three STIs right so I would like to draw your attention to this graph this is the statistics from the national STD AIDS campaign about the reported STIs uh, in our country so according to this graph you could see the commonest is genital herpes followed by non-gonococcal infection. Here non-gonococcal infection is mostly uh, chlamydial infection because uh, due to limitations in resources, we do not carry out any confirmatory tests for chlamydia. Therefore, uh, we see this as non-gonococcal infection. Then it is followed by genital warts, syphilis, gonorrhea, and uh, trichomonasis. Right. Next, regarding patient evaluation and management. So, as family doctors, we do have to have in our mind that we are not treating the disease, but the person with the disease. When we are evaluating, we do have to evaluate the symptom and its progression, and the sexual history is very important when it comes to STI management. So, the last exposure of the sexual act, whether it was vaginal, anal, or oral, whether the partner was an insertive partner, the receptive partner, and also about the condom use, and also details about the partner, whether it is a monogamous relationship, a polygamous relationship, uh, whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, marital partner, casual, or commercial, and also whether the partner is symptomatic. Then past history of STIs and HIV will also give uh, clues about the risk behaviors and also anything addition to be done in the management phase. Also, it's important to assess the HIV-related risk factors other than sexual acts because sometimes it might have some impact on the management because we have to keep in mind these groups of patients may have additional risk behaviors such as IV drug abuse, uh, substance abuse, and so on, which will put them at a higher risk of acquiring HIV and uh, hepatitis B, et cetera. So that is also important. And then treatment history, especially when it comes to our setup, over-the-counter antibiotics is freely available. And also, in addition, they might share the treatment with their partners. So before coming to you, they might have already taken certain antibiotics. So probing that element is also important in the history. Then for women, it is very much important, the LRMP, the menstrual history, and the possibility of uh, pregnancy, and also their fertility plans. In male partners, it's important to find out whether the 
uh, spouse is pregnant because that also can have an implication in the management. And then contraception is important as we are looking at the whole person. So these groups may take, may have risky behaviors and they may end up having unintended pregnancy. So preventing uh, abortion is important here uh, when you're looking at the patient. So promoting a reliable contraceptive method is very important. Uh, yes, I mentioned about the other risk behaviors like substance abuse here. Uh, they might uh, engage in sex uh, under the influence of these substances. Then their sexual behavior can be at a higher risk and they may not be able to recall what exactly went on. And on the other hand, people who are addicted to uh, drugs might engage in sex as a means of finding money. So th those things are interrelated, so like, probing that aspect is very much important. Then intimate partner violence could be commoner in... Uh, people who are at higher risk of STIs. Simply because once they get the STI, they might be discriminated within the marriage and be subjected to partner violence. And also because these people might be coming from uh, socially underprivileged backgrounds, they might be at a higher risk of part intimate partner violence, domestic violence, etc. Then. Being having a STI per se may put them at a higher risk of uh, going through the stress of dealing with the STI, and therefore how it is affecting their mental health have to be evaluated, and the social issues are also important. When it comes to examination, a comprehensive general examination looking for fever, rash, joints, and eyes is important because some of the STIs like uh, GEC can have disseminated gonorrhea and chlamydial infection can lead to um, reactive arthritis, seronegative reactive arthritis, uh, writer's disease, and so on, so it's important. Genital examination should involve looking for rashes, ulcers, warts, and for females, a speculum in examination is essential looking for the healthy cervix, vaginal discharge, etc., and also cervical motion tenderness, and in axial tenderness, etc., and abdominal tenderness to rule out the possibility of PID. When it comes to males, you have to retract the foreskin and see whether there are any underlying lesions, ulcers, warts uh, over the glands, and also uh, you might have to follow certain techniques like milking of the urethra to uh, see whether there is a discharge, and also you have to keep in mind when you are examining uh, when the male patient or the female patient has, especially the male patient has passed urine. So if it is within the four hours, you are very unlikely to uh, observe any discharge. Especially this matters when people who are very much anxious after a high risk behavior and they actually don't have any full blown symptoms and still they will come up with vague symptoms. In this situation to actually uh, assess the possibility, you do have to follow these uh, restrictions and uh, examine them within uh, uh, after four hours of passing the urine and uh, following techniques like milk in the urethra. And based on the sexual act, you do have to examine the anal canal, the oral cavity, and also if you have the facilities, you may collect specimens for uh, further investigations. So as primary care doctors or family doctors, what is our aim when it comes to uh, STI management? As I emphasized earlier, there is a component of social stigma and they may not want to go to a specialist care or STD clinic. So in that case, you have to provide the maximum possible, but at least you have to see that the treat, the, if it is a treatable STI, that the patient remains cured in the first instant itself. So rather than postponing it to a latter date to prescribe the necessary medication, uh, it is better always in the first encounter itself, even if the patient needs referral, give the medication, see that the patient is at least non-effective before you turn off the patient. Health education and promotion of safe sex is very much important, and also a comprehensive approach, which I'll be um, dealing in the next few sides, should be offered, and ongoing support. We have to keep in mind some of these patients might continue with their risky behaviors throughout and they may not be fo being followed up or they may not turn up for the follow-up at STD clinics. So as a family doctor, continuous education, screening, supportive uh, services, etc. is important. 
and as a family doctor the other important thing is not like in the std clinic here it will the spouse the wife the husband will be your patient the kids may be your patient so it you have to keep in mind that confidentiality is very very important otherwise you might lose the patient and cause unnecessary trouble marital issues within the family so the confidentiality is something that you have to always keep in mind and then referral in uh, when indicated that which applies across the board for any condition as a family doctor right now in this slide i would like to take you through the elements of comprehensive st management especially at a gp setting or a family doctor situation so like i emphasized first treatment pharmacological treatment then abstinence should be uh, recommended till you have finished your treatment till your partner is treated completely and you are asymptomatic then in all possible instances you have to look into screening for other stis of course in any setting you can draw blood and test for hiv vdrl hep b and c right but uh, for the other stis you might need uh, special uh, facilities so in that instance if you cannot offer that and especially if the patient is at high risk it is recommended to refer to a std clinic patient education is very important uh, about the stis the future implications on relationships which i will be leading a little bit in detail because it's very important as a family doctor and uh, also uh, how to prevent acquiring any stis promote abstinence promote being faithful being in monogamous relationships and if not con persistent use of uh, correct use of condoms contraception is very important as i highlighted earlier so you have to choose and guide them to uh, for a contraceptive method uh, which matches with their risky behaviors cervical screening once again as you know it is uh, identified as caused by hpv which is once again sexually transmissible therefore these uh, women are at a higher risk of cervical cancer so you might initiate uh, the cervical screening process at a earlier age maybe even at the uh, age of 25 and the frequency of recommendation uh, doing a uh, screening is shorter than for a uh, no risk woman or low risk woman and addressing the psychosocial issues is important what i highlighted earlier like uh, domestic violence uh, and uh, other depression or whatever which might be uh, caused by this sti related issues then finally the follow up is very much important as a family doctor we are bound to give continuity of care so at the follow up visit it is essential that you ensure that the patient is cured that they have complied with your treatment and that the partner is treated and if needed if you think there could be a recurrence you might think of uh, retesting uh, going for a test of cure for gonococcal infection the test of cure is recommended but for chlamydia because we use the test that is based on the dna which will remain even after killing the bug so you it will give a false positive even if it is completely treated so though in those instances where a test of qo is recommended you can think of doing those as well uh, according to the available facilities if not you do have to refer to a std clinic so let's go through what are the indications for referral so i am again emphasizing for the importance of screening for other stis whenever possible if you don't have the facilities you might have to think of referring uh, looking for local and systemic complications is important then you do have to refer diagnostic uncertainty and poor response to first line medication is important and re possibility of reinfection then you might have to do for i mean if, you, if for example if it is gc you have to rely on antibiotic sensitivity then in that case you need uh, special laboratory facilities and in cases where partner is hiv positive or it, who has a high hiv risk then you do might have to uh, refer the patient which i will be dealing in the next slide what facilities that the std clinics could offer 
Pregnancy, definitely, the patient should be referred to ob obstetrician early as possible and also to a STD specialist. Neonates and children, you have to uh, liaise with the pediatrician and STI specialist when managing. And also in uh, patients with high-risk behaviors like substance abuse, domestic violence, whatever, you have to provide shared care with the psychiatrist, social services, uh, etc. Right. So I just mentioned about the high-risk individuals at STD clinics. Uh, what are the services that they could offer? So they do have HIV post-exposure prophylaxis, which is given for 28 days. Then you have pre-exposure prophylaxis, which could be daily or uh, event-driven basis. So this could be offered for people with partners with HIV positive or who are subjected to very high-risk behaviors, uh, sexual abuse, and so on, if you refer, refer to these sites. And also rapid HIV testing and rapid syphilis test is available in STD clinics. So in the first instance itself, you can uh, detect this and initiate treatment, which will um, guarantee a cure. And then screening for hepatitis B, C, Hep B vaccine is also available in STD clinics. And you have additional support with the public health staff for partner tracing and also trained staff for health education and behavioral change communication, which is an added advantage in these facilities. Right, my next uh, slides are based on the recommendations on STI management from the uh, is sexually transmitted infection guideline issued by the National AIDS campaign, campaign. This is a book that I would recommend you all to refer to if you want any information. It gives a comprehensive uh, information about the disease and the management, but it is more targeted for STD clinic facilities. On the other hand, the WHO book, which concentrates on the management of symptomatic uh, sexually transmitted infections, considers the availability of different testing facilities, and they have separate recommendations based on the facilities that you have. So if you are managing in a resource poor setting, you can always be, uh, go manage your patients in a scientific manner by following one of these algorithms. So this is from the WHO guideline, which they have five um, syndromic approaches and have algorithms. So if you could see in this slide, you could see they have recommendations based on the availability of uh, different uh, facilities. So you can follow this if you do not have um, testing facilities and you think you have to somehow uh, prescribe something and uh, cure the patient and if the patient especially is not happy to visit a STD clinic. Right. Next, uh, I would like to focus, uh, since uh, the highest prevalent is seen for genital herpes, non-gonococcal infection, that is chlamydial infection and genital warts, I will be focusing on these three STIs as time goes on. Okay, uh, so genital chlamydial infection, uh, it's caused by uh, intracellular, intracellular bacterium, that is chlamydia trachomatis, and uh, serotype DK is responsible for the urethritis. So the main symptoms are the urethral discharge, uh, dysuria. In female, you can have abdominal pain, uh, cervical excitation, etc., based on the extent of the infection. In the next few slides, what I want to highlight is the local complications. Uh, because in the presence of local in, um, uh, in, uh, complications, by simply giving the first-line medication, you, not, you may not be able to eradicate the infection. So they might come with recurrences. So therefore, lo detecting local complications is important, and they may benefit with referral. So what are the local complications? Vesiculitis, that is involvement of the semi seminal vesicles. In addition to the routine symptoms, these patients might present with hematuria, painful erection, fever, suprapubic pain, and stranguria, and discomfort in the rectum. Prostatitis, I'm not going to elaborate. That's another complication. Then the corpus gland involvement, that is corporitis. Uh, you can see from number seven uh, there, if that gland is involved, again, you can have perineal uh, area pain and also pain fluidification, and also sometimes urinary retention. So evaluating for these things in the history examination is important. 
Then involvement of the Tyson gland, you could see the Tyson gland is a gland situated on either side of the frenulum. You can see the discharge on the second photograph onto your left side. So this is also another complication. These complications are common with GC, but could happen with uh, chlamydia as well because I'm not uh, talking about GC. I just thought these slides would be helpful. So other things are the extra genital infections like re uh, rectal, pharyngeal, and conjunctival infection also can happen. And you all are aware of, of the other common uh, complications of uh, chlamydial infection, which also includes PDI and uh, epididymocytis and sexually acquired reactive arthritis, which I mentioned earlier. Right, so how do we diagnose chlamydia because we don't have specific tests like culture for this the test available is the NAT the nucleic acid amplification test but in other than that in rose uh, low resource settings we also go by the smears the gram stains so if the pus cell numbers are above a certain limit they diagnose urethritis and cervicitis and they label them as gon non gonococcal uh, uh, urethritis, non-gonococcal infection. So that is how in the graph, the, those non-gonococcal infections came as the second highest um, STI reported. So the specific test would be the NAT. Uh, so the advantage of being having NAT is the vulvovaginal sample is equally effective as the endocervical sample. So if, even if you don't have the facility to take the sample, even a self-administrated uh, swab can be taken by the patient and go for testing. And in for, when it comes for males, the first catch urine can be used for the NAT, um, and it is better or equally uh, sensitive uh, like the urethral sampling as well. So these are the tests that, this is the test that can be used, and also for rectal swabs, you can use this test. So the management uh, for uncomplicated genital, rectal, and pharyngeal in infection is the same. Uh, it's doxy or azithromycin. If these are contraindicated, you can go for uh, erythromycin as well. Right, then the next important thing is the partner treatment. When it comes to partner treatment, the look back period is important. So the look back period differs in depend on the patient category. So if your index patient is a male with symptoms, the look back period is four weeks. For all other instances, that is asymptomatic men, women, etc., the look back period is six months. So basically any sexual contact should be epidemiologically treated. So what is epidemiological treatment is whether the screening test, the test that you do, whether it is positive or negative, you treat it as a case with the same treatment given for a, a confirmed patient. So in addition, you have to uh, advise them about uh, avoiding any sexual contact till it is totally cured, till your partner is um, treated, and also you have completed the regime. If it is a single dose regime, you have to give an additional allowance of seven days for abstinence. Right, so next uh, about genital herpes. So genital herpes is caused by type 1 and type 2 viruses. And if time allows, I will focus on that at, towards the end of the session. Right, uh, so genital warts, I'm sure you know most of the things, uh, but I would like to highlight few things because uh, I won't focus uh, on the management because of the time uh, limit, but I would like to give, share, you, share with you some key points which is useful in educating the patients. So genital warts is caused by HPV. So HPV, there are about 100 serotypes and type 6 and 11 are the ones responsible for genital warts. What you can tell the patient is even if you had an exposure with a uh, ward, uh, per, per person who was diagnosed with warts, the chances of you acquiring the infection or having symptomatic warts is about 90%. Uh, but only about 10% who are infected will transmit the virus. So the transmission risk is quite low, which will be very assuring for the patient once you share this information. And the, it is spread through direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, and it is usually through sexual contact. And because it's skin-to-skin -skin contact, you have to keep in mind the possibility of auto-inoculation, where you can uh, get the warts in your hands, etc. 
And the long-term implications, few points to highlight. About three out of four uninfected partners develop them within eight months. So it can take a long time after the disc behavior. And 30% of the genital warts will disappear within four months. And most genital warts will recur within three months of completion of initial therapy. That is, you, there's no reassurance that with treatment you can get rid of the infection. You might have a recurrence later on. And 90% of HPV in other infections, the genital warts, will cure within two years, whether you treat it or not. And possible for, uh, there's a possibility of latency, and still there's a risk of recurrences. And the other thing that you have to educate the patient is smoking increases the risk of recurrence. So stopping smoking will help you to remain asymptomatic or and to reduce the recurrences. So I will end my session here uh, considering the time limits. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Arunidhi Silva, for your informative and very impressive and time-suitable lecture uh, given by us. Right? Uh,